Good morning, church. Let me introduce myself. I... I used to be the pastor of this church. My name is Bob. I'm the non-puppy Bob. I hope the welcome gift is medicine. <laughs> I got back from India and Nepal over two weeks ago, and I'm just getting over this virus that I've been carrying with me. I'm 75% there, but not quite there, so thank you all for praying. If you were here Thursday for Stephen Shrunk's uh, memorial service, uh, you'll know my voice right now is uh, 10 times better than it was even on Thursday. I want to thank all the elders and uh, missionaries that were speaking in my stead for the last five weeks. I appreciate all the work that they have done in preparing messages for this congregation. I'm going back to Genesis. We titled this series uh, at the beginning of the year, The Beginnings. Today we're going to look at the first man and couple. With Todd Patterson's assistance, uh, we've covered the seven days of creation the last Sunday in December and the first Sunday in January. But I want to cover a couple of primary takeaways as a review of Genesis 1 through chapter 2, verse 3. The first thing I want to remind you of is Genesis 1 is the first chapter of Torah. Torah. We call it the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. It it introduces the main themes, primarily the land and man, which will be covered as seed in the future, the descendants, and of course, covenant. God makes covenant with his people. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1 describes God's first work of creation. We call it ex nihilo, meaning out of nothing. He created everything out of nothing. And John Salehammer, who was my professor when I was going to school at Trinity in Old Testament Hebrew, he wrote a book called The Pentateuch as Narrative, Genesis Unbound, and he wrote uh, the book of Genesis in the Expositor's Bible Commentary, and I rely heavily on his work. After all, he was my professor. He wrote the rest of the chapter after Genesis 1-1, describes God's further activity of preparing the land to be inhabited by man. That's his thesis for Genesis 1. And so he proposed a better translation of the word Hebrew word shemayim, is not heaven, but sky. And a better translation of the word Eretz is land, not earth. So in the beginning, God created the skies and the land. Now, Derek Kidner also wrote a book in Genesis in the Tyndale Old Testament commentaries. And he wrote, the six days can be viewed as the positive counterpart of the twin negatives in Chapter 1, verse 2, which says the land was out without form and void, meaning uninhabitable. And he matches the days with form and fullness. So I put in your notes, and if you get the notes every Sunday, you'll notice that this is more of a college lecture notes than it is for just a sermon. So day one and day four are similar, day two and day three five are similar, day three and day six is similar. So in day one, there's light and darkness, and then day four, there's lights of day and the moon at night and stars at night. Day two, he talks about the sea and the sky, and 
In day five, he talks about the creatures of the water and the air. In day three, it talks about a fertile land, vegetation. In day six, we have the creatures who are on the land, animals, and finally man. And then there's day seven. And day seven begins in chapter two, verses one through three. And you'll notice that it talks twice about God completed, God completed. And twice it talks about God rested from all his work. And in verse 3, God blessed that seventh day and sanctified it. This is all in anticipation of what is going to be known as Sabbath day. In Exodus chapter 20, in the Ten Commandments, in commandment number 4, it says in Exodus 20 verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So creation, the days, focuses on six days, and then there's a seventh day. It's, it's all in anticipation of the work week and the Sabbath day. And you get to chapter 2, verse 4. And it shows Moses intended for this second chapter to be read closely with the first chapter. This is the count of the heavens or the skies and the land when they were created in the day that the Lord God made land and sky. The account is a continuation, chapter 2. So if we look at chapter 1, the creation account comes to a climax in day 6 with the creation of man. Man who is made in the image of God. Man, male and female. It says in Genesis 1.27... God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, in Genesis 2, man is presented as the pivot of the story. He's in every section that I'm going to break down today. He's in every section. He's the pivot. And Derek Kidner in his commentary says, it's misleading to call this a second creation account because it hastens to localize the scene, passing straight from the world at large to a garden in the east. And all that follows is played out on that narrow stage. So let's look at the account of the first man in the land. This is the account of the heavens and earth, again, I'm going to say skies and land, when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven or land and skies. First thing we're going to notice, though, in chapter 1, we have God, 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 Elohim, all through it, God, Elohim. Now, we're going to see in chapter 2, we have Yahweh. When you see Lord in capital letters, that's Yahweh. So it's Yahweh, Elohim. Pretty consistent through chapter 2. It's Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God. And he says, No shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For Yahweh Elohim had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, formed man of dust, From the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The first thing we notice here is God formed man from the dust of the ground. But in verse 5, we see that the land is kind of inhabitable. Notice these selected items that Moses lists. No shrub of the field. 
The word shrub has the idea of this wild shrub, uncultivated plant. In Genesis 21, verse 15, when Hagar and Ishmael leave Sarah's presence and go into the wilderness, they run out of water and she puts him under this shrub, this wild bush, because she didn't want to see him die. No shrub of the field, no plant of the field. The word plant here, herb, is more of a cultivated plant. He, got, he goes on to say, no rain. And then, no man to till the ground. Why did Moses use these selective items of all the things he could write about? Well, I think all these selected items were to anticipate what's going to come in the next chapter in the fall. So when he talks about no shrub and no plant... In the fall, we have Genesis 3.18, both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you and you will eat the plants of the field. But the curse is you're not going to even have shrubs and, and plants. You're going to have thorns and thistles because of the curse. No rain. It's a future anticipation of God sending rain in the flood. In Genesis 7, verse 10, it came about after the seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth. And in verse 12, the rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And no man to till the ground. Well, because of the curse, in Genesis 3, 23, therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate or to work the ground from which he was taken. So all of these things are put in place there because it's anticipating what's going to take place in the fall. When man sins. Verse 6 is very problematic. Because verse 5 says it's kind of like, uh, well, here's the earth, kind of desolate, kind of like the land without form and void. And then you get verse 6, it seems to be a positive thing. A mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. That word mist is only used twice in all of Scripture. (laughs) Here and in Job 36, verse 27, which isn't much of a help. So commentators start to look at maybe it doesn't mean mist. Maybe it means underground river systems like springs or streams, as some translations have. That these streams would rise up and inundate the land. Verse 5 seems to be a negative thing. Verse 6, it looks like it's a positive thing. But if it meant that the land gets unindated with water, that could be a negative thing as well, meaning it's uninhabitable. So verse 5 and 6, uninhabitable land, and then God does the formation of man. Verse 5 says no man. Verse 7, now we have man. The Lord God formed man. Every time we see the word man here, the man, it's ha-adam. Ha is the definite article meaning the, ha. And adam is meaning man. So God formed man from dust. The word form has the idea of he fashioned man, he crafted man. It's a picture of a craftsman. God's a craftsman who's fashioning man, kind of like the potter does with the clay. This is a total contrast from chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, where man is male and female, made in God's image and in God's likeness, like God. Here, the emphasis is not on like God, it's like dust, like the ground, It's emphasizing not that man is somehow divine, but man is more creature than he is divine. He's like the other creatures who were made from the ground. The emphasis is on dust. In Hebrew, there's a play on sounds where you have the man and you have the ground. The ground is Adamah. Adam is Adam. So we have ha-adam, min ha-adamah. 
meaning man is from the ground. God, we would say in English, God formed the earthling from the earth. He's an earthling. He's a creature like the others. Back in chapter 1, verse 24, God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures. Man is just like other living creatures, except there's a big difference with the animal kingdom and man. Because in verse 7, it says, God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. And Ha'adam became a living being or a living soul. Dr. Salehammer again says in the Expositor's Bible Commentary of Genesis, you can see in this picture of man's origin an anticipation of his destiny after fall when he would again return to dust. Yahweh Elohim formed man. Now in verses 8 through 14, we have the Lord God planted a garden and placed the man in it. Yahweh God planted a garden toward the east in Eden. And there he placed the man whom he had fashioned, craft, or formed. And then it talks about the garden. Out of the ground, Yahweh God, Lord God, caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. The Bedalium and the Onyx Stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. God planted a garden. He placed man in it. And we're told of the garden's location. It's in Eden. Not so much the Garden of Eden, but Eden's a place, and it's in Eden. And it tells us it's in the east. The east of what? (laughs) That's the question, east of what? Well, Moses obviously is writing from the idea of the land, Palestine, and so most commentators say, well, it's east of Palestine. Now, when you think of garden, you can't think of like a flower bed or vegetable plants that you plant outside your house. Garden is more like a a park-like setting, a park, kind of like one of our national parks, right? Big parks like Yellowstone. A lot of acres in Yellowstone, a lot of miles in that park, yes. Like the Grand Canyon, like the Redwoods. Think of garden like that, a large plot of land in a park light setting. Eden, by the way, has the word, it means delight. Delight. It talks about the garden's vegetation. Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God, caused to grow every tree in this garden, every tree. It's not talking about the whole world now. We're talking about a single place, meaning the garden. Trees that are pleasing to sight, good for food. What trees are good for food? Well, I think of apple trees, orange trees, grapefruits, uh, cherry trees. You can Go on, you can name them. But then it gets two specific trees, the tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden. Now, when you think of the tree of life, it's also in Revelation, Revelation 2 7, Revelation 22 2, 22 14, 22 19. The tree of life has the idea not that it gives immortality, like you take a bite of the tree of life, you have immortality, but it gives you extension of life. As long as you keep eating it, your life keeps getting extended. Adam and Eve were not forbidden to eat of the tree of life. They could eat of it. Perhaps they did. 
That's the first specific tree. The second specific tree is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The word in Hebrew for good is the word tov. Tov. Evil is ra. Tov and ra. Good and evil. A tree that imparts wisdom. Discernment, what is tov, what is good, and what is ra, what is evil, what is right, what is wrong. What it means to be obedient to God and disobedient to God. That's the vegetation in the garden. Then we have the garden source of water. Talks about one river that divides into four. Two rivers we know, two we don't know. He lists ones we don't know first. So here's a map. I can play with this map because it's on my little (laughs) thing here. Okay. Okay. So with this map, two rivers we don't know. The first is Pishon. And some think uh, John Walton in his commentary says, well, over here by Medina, there was a dry riverbed that goes to the Persian Gulf. And from satellite pictures, you could see a dry riverbed. You want to take this? All right. So where was I? (laughs) Okay, here we have the Red Sea. The Red Sea, and there was a dry riverbed that went over there to the Persian Gulf. Satellite pictures, they felt like it uh, dried up in 2000 or so BC. But there was a river that they thought went there. Perhaps that was the Pishon River. And therefore, if you wanted to dig down here, dig deep, you would find what? Lots of gold, <laughs> okay, gold and, and bedallium and all that kind of stuff. The other one is Gihon. The Gihon River, they have no idea where it is, but down here we have Palestine or Israel, but if you keep going to Egypt and go further and further down, you get to Ethiopia, which is Cush, and that, would go, that river would go around that whole area of Cush. So you have maybe one river that goes this way, one river that goes this way, and those are the two rivers we don't know, and anybody's guess is on that. But the two rivers we do know is the Tigris, which goes, by the way, I'm going backwards, it starts at the left and goes down to the Persian Gulf, that's the Tigris, and then you have the Euphrates River. So they all start here. And they go this way, and they go this way, and possibly it goes this way, and possibly it goes this way. (laughs) One river out of Eden, waters four, becomes four different, waters the whole land. But it all focuses also around the land, right? Which is Moses' intent, showing that it's all about the land. The next map we have, see, even here, now they say, this is from, by the way, the ESV study Bible. If you've got the ESV study Bible, you'll see this map in there. This is what they think. In the mountain range up here is where Eden probably might have been, and the four rivers coming from there. This is called the Fertile Crescent because of the two rivers, the Euphrates and Tigris, water that well. Whenever there is war with Israel, and it's coming from the east, Assyria or Babylon. They all travel this way and then fight. Okay? Nobody goes through the desert. (laughs) They all go through the well-watered land for their armies. Of course, with Egypt being a major empire down here, and then Assyria and Babylon being over here, this was like the tollway. They all wanted that land because if you control the land of Palestine, you can control the trade routes. All right, I'm off topic. Anyway, what I'm trying to tell you is two rivers we know, two rivers we don't know. God planted a garden in Eden, and it's going to be called Garden Eden. 
Now in verse 15, we have God gave man in the garden commands to live by. Commands. Yahweh God, the Lord God, took the man, put him into the garden of Eden. Notice that if you go back to verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man. So it's just repeating, man again is the central pivot of this whole thing. So like the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to what? To cultivate it and keep it. Cultivate means to work it, to serve it, to keep it, to watch it, to take care of it. Even before Adam and Eve sinned, there was work. It's honorable to work. It's not a result of the fall that we, man has to work. The Lord took Adam, put him in the garden to work it. Now, the two Hebrew words for work, which is abad and to keep or watch, samar, those two words often are used in a religious setting, meaning that you worship or serve God. That's the idea of serve and observing his commandments, watching his commandments, meaning that you worship and you obey those two commands. Now, if the Garden of Eden pictures, this is where God's presence is, like Todd tried to tell us that the whole Genesis account is a picture of the tabernacle because that's where God's presence is. Well, then you have God's presence in the garden, which he was because he was walking in the cool of the garden. Talk. Anyway, we're going to get to that next week. Then you have Adam's primary duty in the garden is to worship and obey the Lord. And interestingly, we get the positive command from any tree of the garden you may freely eat. That's a command. Eat. Eat of every tree. Anything you see in the garden, nothing is off limits. But God had one negative command, one prohibition. From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. My professor, Dr. Salehammer, said, the inference of God's command in verses 16 and 7 is that God alone knows what is good. God alone knows what's tov. For man, he knows what's good for man. And that God alone knows what is not good, what is ra for man. To enjoy the good, man must trust God and obey him. If man disobeys, he will have to decide for himself what is good and what is not good. Now, while to modern man such a prospect may seem to be desirable, to the author of Genesis, it is the worst fate that could ever befall him. Only God knows what is good for man. Because only God knows what is good. Genesis chapter 1, God created this, it was good. God created this day, it was good. God created man, it was very good. Every time we see good in the here, it's told. All through the scripture, it is good, it's good, it's good. Trust God for the good. And so God gives one negative prohibition. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because the punishment of disobedience is death. Now, where it says in the day, this is a major way in Hebrew of saying when, when you do this. Not if you do this in a 24 hour period, you'll be dead. It's got the idea of when this happens, the process of death begins. Decay begins. So God gave man in the garden commands to live by. And the chapter ends with this final fourth section where God declared it is not good. 
Everything is good, 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 good. And now he, God says it's not good. What's not good? It's not good for Adam, for the man, to be alone. After all, in chapter 1, man is supposed to be fruitful and multiply, male and female, yet there's no female. So now we get to the point where God makes the female. As we look at verse 18, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. A couple things regarding the word helper. The English word helper does not accurately convey the connotation of the Hebrew word ezer, which means helper. Usage of the Hebrew term does not suggest a subordinate role, a connotation which English helper can have. In the Bible, God is frequently described as the helper, the one who does for, what, for us what we cannot do for ourselves, the one who meets our needs. In this context, the word seems to express the idea of an indispensable companion. Helper is an indispensable companion, not someone to come alongside man just to give him help, as if that woman is going to be a subordinate to the man. That's not in the text. She's an indispensable companion. And where it says suitable for him... That Hebrew expression for a suitable literally means according to the opposite of him. Suitable is according to the opposite of him. Translations such as suitable, which the NASB and others were matching, corresponding to, all capture the idea. A translation that says partner doesn't quite accurately describe it. It does not reflect the nuance of correspondence to or the suitability for. So the man's form and nature are matched by the woman's as she reflects him and complements him. Together they correspond. New King James has, it's, she's comparable to him. So God made for him one to come alongside him who is comparable to him. So God says in verse 18, I will make him a helper which corresponds to him. So how does he do it? Well, he makes all the animals first. <laughs> God formed every beast and bird out of the ground. Out of the ground, Yahweh Elohim formed every beast of the field, every bird of the sky, brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle, meaning livestock, domesticated or animals that can be domesticated. And to the birds of the sky, and to every beast of the field. Those are really the untamed animals. So we have man giving names. Hippopotamus, rhinoceros, platypus, <laughs> dodo bird. And that was his name. Shows intelligence that the man... Adam had. But notice how the verse ends. But for Adam. Now notice it doesn't say Ha Adam. It leaves off the definite article. It makes this a proper name. First time Adam's name is mentioned. Throughout this chapter, it's Ha Adam, Ha Adam, the man, the man, the man. Now it's Adam. But for Adam. There was not found a helper who corresponded to him. So God performed the first medical operation. The 
First thing he does is he puts Adam into a deep sleep. Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he, meaning Yahweh Elohim, took one of his ribs, took something inside him out, and then he closed up the flesh at that place. I don't know if he used stitches, staples, or glue. (laughs) All we know is he closed them up. Our translation puts uh, the idea of rib here. It really isn't the word for rib. Literally, it means from his side. Meaning there's something inside his side that he pulled out. He reached in, pulled out stuff. It must have included bone and flesh because that's what Adam says later. But he took out inside stuff. And what's he do with this inside stuff? It says the Lord God fashioned. The word really there is he built. Okay, he built. Now, literally, it says Yahweh Elohim built the side stuff which he took from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. In Hebrew, he built an Isha. That's the word for woman, isha. From ish, man. Another word for man is ish. Isha from ish. And he brought her to the man. He's wide awake now. Brought her is this idea of first marriage. Brought her to the man. And in verse 23, we have the first words that man has spoken in Scripture. This is the first dialogue, and it's poetic. Basically, what he says is, wowza. (laughs) Imagine Adam. Sees one now who is suitable to him, corresponds to him. He sees the similarities, sees the correspondence. He's thinking she's not like any of the creatures I have ever seen. I just named them all. The dog may be man's best friend, but wow. Wow. I want this one. And so he says in poetry fashion, this one, I'm going to say it in literal Hebrew, this one, now or at last, this one is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She'll be called woman, Isha, for out of man, Ish, this one was taken. Creating the image of God, male and female. Chapter 2 tells us all about how that was done. And the chapter ends with the narrator's final remarks. Moses' final remarks. For this reason. Everything that God did with this operation had a purpose. For this reason. The reason is what we call marriage. For this reason, a man. This is not Adam. This is Ish. Ish leaves his father and mother and is joined. That word is cleaves to or clings to, being joined together, united to his Isha. And that shall become one flesh. And the second remark that Moses makes to man and his wife 
were naked and not ashamed. Why put that verse in there? Because after chapter 3, they're not going to be naked anymore, and they are ashamed. Chapter 2 is a hinge chapter. It connects with chapter 1, giving specific details of the land and making of man and woman. Yet chapter 2 is closely connected with chapter 3, detailing the man and woman's disobedience to the one prohibition which was given in the garden. Let me close with Jesus' teaching on marriage from Mark. It takes place in a confrontation that Jesus has with the Pharisees over divorce. In Mark chapter 10, verse 2, some Pharisees came up to Jesus testing him and began to question him whether it was lawful for a man to divorce a wife. Is it lawful for Ish to divorce his Isha? And he answered and said to them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her out or send her away. But Jesus said, yes, he did that for this reason, because of your hardness of hearts. Man can have a hard heart, right? Women can have a hard heart. Because of the hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, going back to Genesis 2, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. Now, Matthew's version of this says, and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, meaning in marriage, let no man separate. From the beginning of creation, God made how many genders? What are they? Are there any other genders? We're going to be kicked off YouTube. (laughs) They are no longer two but one flesh. That's pretty clear, isn't it? God's plan for marriage is one male, one ish, and one female, one isha, joined together as one flesh. Marriage, not two males, not two females, not a male and another male who wants to be a female, not a female and another female who wants to be a man. God's plan is for a female and a male in marriage. God's plan is not for a male and female to have sex without being joined together in marriage. This is so countercultural. Because if a man loves a woman, it doesn't matter if there's marriage. Why can't we just have sex? Because that's not God's plan from the beginning. Now, I know some have had sex before marriage. I know that some are in same-sex relationships. The good news of the gospel is there is forgiveness when there's repentance. And when a person places their faith in Jesus Christ and wants to follow Christ with their heart, they confess their sin of the past and they move forward in the present Not looking backwards, right? Not forgetting the things that are behind and pressing on. There's forgiveness for those who repent. Enough said. 
I can't wait till next week where we look at the consequences of disobedience. Chapter 3 is connected to chapter 2. Read ahead if you want to. <laughs> it's all good stuff. But the key is in chapter 3, God gives the promise of a redeemer. The seed of the woman is going to crush the serpent's head. That's next week. Lord, we come before you thanking you for marriage. Thanking you for the two genders. What a joy it is when a man meets a woman and get married and are fruitful and multiply, have children who get married and have children. And my wife and I are pleased to have so many grandchildren. We thank you for the creation of man and woman, how they complement one another. And Lord, for anyone in this room who maybe has gone outside of what the Lord commands is right for sexual behavior, I pray that they would seek forgiveness and repentance and live holy. Lord, you've taught us much in this chapter. Much went over our heads. But the chapter is pretty clear. We're to be obedient to you. To follow you. Because you know what's good. And you know what's good for me, for us. So Lord, when we try to act independently and decide what's good for ourselves, apart from you, you'll show us clearly that that good is really not good. Help us to live according to your word because it shows us what is right and also what is wrong. We love you, Lord. We love your son, Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself up on the cross for us that we could be forgiven, cleansed, and made righteous. We love our Lord. We follow him. And it's in his name I pray. Amen.